Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. Welcome back to the XY Advisor Podcast. My name's Fraser Jack, and today I am joined by Dr. Adam Fraser. Welcome. Fraser, it's great to be here. Fantastic to have you uh, on the show again, Dan, and, and a, always a great conversation. Love having a, a chat to you. But uh, today we're talking around the recent study that you've been doing, and uh, I'll we probably need to give a bit of a warning here that some of the information that we're going to talk about today could be quite confronting for a lot of uh, advisors. Yeah, it's a mixed bag and there, there is there is some bad news in there, um, but also there's a light at the end of the tunnel, most importantly. Fantastic. Now, let's let's talk about this. Uh, I call it the Financial Advisor Mental Health Study. Is that what we're calling it still? Yeah, I mean, well, uh, primarily we, we wanted to answer three things. What is the current state of mental health and well-being of advisors in Australia? And secondly, of those that have good mental health and well-being, what are their habits? What are their strategies? And the third one is also, if you think about all the change that they've gone through, who are the advisors that are evolving and uh, transforming their business to be more effective? So, so it was about health and well-being, but also about business performance as well. Yeah. So those were the three things that we, we studied. Yeah, fantastic. Now let's go back. Let's go back a step. Um, you have been working with financial planners in an financial advice industry for many, many years, uh, but you also work in in other industries and and professions. Uh, what what inspired this study in the first place? Yeah, well, it was quite an emotional thing because I was presenting at a a dealer group conference, and I did a keynote, and within that, I talked about some of the big projects we'd done with school principals around burnout, um, partners in professional services firms. And afterwards, I I literally at the drinks got bailed up by about five or six advisors who were all kind of 50 plus males who said, you got to do that stuff. You got to do that for us because we're not coping. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, you know, all the changes had a real big impact. They talked about the impact on them as well as, which I didn't know, talked about the the rise in suicide in the profession. And um, they said, like, we're not joking around here. We really need help with this. One of them even followed me to the car that was taking me to the airport. And he said, like, I'm, I'm serious about this. We need your help. So I went back and started to think about it and planned it out and talked to some of those guys and uh, brought Deakin University on board. And then we really just needed someone to fund the research. And I had multiple conversations with people in the industry. And a lot of them kind of gave it lip service and said, yeah, yeah. But when it came to writing a check, (laughs) they were hesitant. But um, I met with AIA and spoke to Damien, the CEO, and I literally didn't even get to finish the sentence. He just went, oh, yeah, we'll fund that for sure. So, um, yeah, AIA come on board to fund the research. Myself and Deakin University did the research and, uh, yeah, we've now got the results. Fantastic. Now, let's go back to the uh, the research conversation. Uh, what, what sort of – how do you put a research project like this in place? What justifies a decent amount of data uh, and how do you go about – you know, working out that before the, 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 you know, the study takes place. How do you set out what's going to be a relevant amount of research? Yeah, it's, it's quite a complicated process. And, and the short answer is you talk to people a lot smarter than I am. Um, so, you know, we had to balance what was practical. So what could advisors do? Because you don't want it to be too onerous. You also want it to um, answer the right questions as well as be powerful enough that we can make um, assumptions. So we spoke to statisticians and we came up with two studies really. So one was a survey that measured all sorts of psychological constructs. And we had 1,108 advisors, um, you know, fill out parts of that survey. I mean, because cause it went for about 20 minutes, people sort of petered off towards the end, but, you know, by, around 800, you know, completed it. 
Um, and then the second part of the study is we wanted to do a deeper dive than just a survey. So we had 43 advisors fill out a seven-day diary study where they documented what they did, how they felt, where they were spending their time. And then we did an interview with a researcher from Deakin University to kind of pull that part and make sense of it. So that were the two sides of the study. Yeah, wow. So, uh, so I'm really interested in the seven-day um, diary study. Yeah. That's uh, You're talking about how they're feeling throughout different parts of the day? It asks them at three points in the day, they are asked questions that – so the questions are around, well, where have you spent your time? What sort of tasks have you done? How did you feel when you were doing that task? What's your energy levels like? How productive were you? So there, there's various questions. But, I mean, the thing about this study is it's it's much more detailed than just they filled out a survey monkey survey. Yep. You know, it, it, it goes quite deep and the analysis is 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 very strong. Yeah, I, I really resonated with the term you just used then um, in the previous in this round. You know, powerful enough to make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is the this is the big picture, right? Because at the end of the day, the results from the sort of survey can be taken to legislators and government and and, and regulators and say, and licensees and and the and the profession as a whole to say this is something that has happened. Uh, there is ways of making it better, and, and please keep this in mind when making future changes. Very much. And also what's what's great about our study and we couldn't control this is we got a really diverse group of people filling it out. So it wasn't just one segment of the profession. You know, they were varying in terms of um, length in the industry, um, age, location. You know, we got people from all over Australia, rural, uh, metro, um, different genders. So uh, it's it's a really good snapshot and a big enough sample that we can make really um, strong statements about the the data. Yeah. Now, one of the things that um, that uh, when you have that diversity across um, generations, as uh, you know, sectors, um, you know, male and female, uh, uh, you know, age or, or length in industry, qualifications, those sorts of things, often we feel like we can group the um, group the outcomes right we feel like yeah. oh most most young advisors will be feeling this way most senior advisors will be feeling that way uh, tell us about that yeah that's a great question and and the natural and not to offend anyone but the natural thing is we go young people are more innovative the older ones are stuck in their ways and don't embrace technology <laughs> one of the biggest findings is that age has no impact on anything that we measured so stress work life balance um acceptance of change innovation um adaptability just age has no bearing on it whatsoever so all those sort of preconceptions we can throw them out because they do not matter I feel like this is a, one of those Mythbusters moments. I quite enjoyed that show. Uh, we should from, explode, blow something up by the end of it. Yes, yeah. we should definitely. So, uh, you know, that's that's the Mythbuster, right? It's about saying that, that that didn't matter. Yeah, and even level of education didn't matter in terms of like whether you left school at year 10, whether year 12, whether you had a degree, post-grad, um, that had very little impact um on on the results as well so i mean one thing that was important were you engaging in professional development and were you continuing to challenge and evolve yourself that was very important but you know that whole thing of well you know if i'm more, I'm more educated I'm, I'm better at all these different things so I think, yeah i think the takeaway for that for me is that mental health mental well-being mental illness can can strike or anybody in any particular part of their industry, any particular part of their career. Yeah, very much. And while we're talking about demographics, even the the gender piece, um, what was really fascinating about that is that women are equal to men in terms of gender didn't really have uh, an, an impact. What we did find is that women are superior to men in a, a couple of areas, which is their ability to engage in industry support, which is critical. Um, they're more accepting of change and they're more proactive around self-development and education. So if you look at this in a traditionally male-dominated industry, we want more women coming in because they're making the industry better. Yes, 
I, I couldn't agree more. I, absolutely, that and that and that wasn't so such a surprise for me out of the result. I think um, I think people that are willing to you know be vulnerable or prepared to reach out to members of the community and 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 look for support and help each other yeah. as well in that in that uh, way definitely a positive part. Now, yeah, and while we're on the Mythbusters piece, length of experience didn't have a very strong impact. So whether you were new or whether you'd been in the industry for 25 plus years um, didn't seem to have a, a very strong relationship. Fantastic. Now I want to get into some of that. Let's get into the nitty gritty. We sort of touched yep. the high level, but let's go, let's go deep into the stats because, um, uh, for, and then after that we might start, start to talk about um what the outcomes are going to be and, uh, and 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 the findings from the report. So let's let's go deep into the stats. Now, I've got this one here in front of me around the concept of feeling stressed. Uh yeah. and and this was a huge number, uh, 9 9 out of 10 feeling stressed. Yeah, have high, I mean if, if we we've, we've been doing this for a long time in terms of we've we've done studies like this in multiple industries and advisors scored the worst in terms of well-being, mental and physical health um, that we've seen in any group. But they also scored, unfortunately, the highest in in terms of stress, burnout, overload um, than any industry that we've looked at before. So that stress figure is is real. It's it's very high. Yeah, and off the charts. And and the and the fact that you can compare it to other professions is really yeah. important. Yeah. And then the professions we're comparing you to are, you know, they're not easy professions. Uh, we're talking partners in professional services firms like big firms, Erson Young, PwC, um, school principals, which is an incredibly stressful job, uh, banking industry, um, even um, uh, paramedics. So, you know, it, it's groups that are highly stressed and, and unfortunately you're higher than all of those. Yeah, I think it's, that's a real uh, shot across the bow warning sign for uh, it's know. it it's colossal. Yeah, yeah. Now, after stress, um, to, to me, stress is the the external factors, uh, but then when it becomes internal, it becomes depression or some type of mental uh, illness. It could be anxiety. Um, talk to us about how the you know numbers of depression. Yeah, it's. Um What we found is 67% of advisors that participated in the study experienced some level of depression. And that ranges from I feel depressed a little of the time to I feel depressed all of the time. And 17% of advisors um, showed that they were depressed most of the time or all of the time, which is just a, a frightening statistic. And what's even more interesting is we compared advisors to the average Australian. So when you compare them to the average person walking around, they're 64% more likely to be in a moderate like mental health risk. They're 51% more likely to be in a high mental health risk group. So if you think about mental health, it's a spectrum. So it goes from, you know, I'm, I'm doing really well to I'm, I'm really suffering. So when you break it into different groups, um, advisors are far more likely to be at a high risk of mental health. And, and compared to the average Australian, they're 11% more likely to be in a very high mental health risk group. So does that make sense about that spectrum? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I sort of feel that people can be moving around on that spectrum depending on the day and the time. Yeah. But if you compare advisors to the average person, they're much more likely, they're, they're at much higher risk of mental health yeah. problems. Now, it's probably a, a good time during the, the session or the podcast to sort of say that if somebody is feeling this way, they should be reaching out for uh, professional help. Very much. Yeah, the, um, and the the number one thing about if you are suffering or feeling like you're suffering from mental health, it's it's reaching out, getting help, getting support is is the most important step. Yep, yep, fantastic. And there's plenty of industry bodies that can help you in that way as a first step, uh, or, uh, or or speak to your doctor. Well, actually, on that Fraser, one of the things uh, from interviews with industry bodies or even you know licensees, they said, well, we put on these mental health strategies or or support and people aren't accessing them. 
So one of the things we showed is that people are feeling this way, but they're not reaching out to get help for it, which is is also concerning. Yep. Now, uh, now stress and burnout, we sort of we mentioned, but this is pushing people uh, to leave the industry, and yeah. you know, we've, there's been talk about numbers dropping off and leaving the, the 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 profession as it becomes a profession, as the qualifications kick in, as the 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 exam um, deadlines start to draw closer. What, what what did you find in the way of people leaving the industry? Yeah, um, we found a very clear picture of forty two percent of advisors in the study said that they were considering leaving the profession due to the stress of the change and the compliance and the exam. A further seventeen percent said, mm, "I'm on the fence. Like I'm not sure whether I'm going to stay or I'm going to go." So you add those two numbers together, and that's almost sixty percent of the profession are. Um, are in that consideration. And and we were looking at other people's data, particularly collected within the industry, and it, it, it's quite similar. So, yeah, I mean, that's for a group that are very important to society, that's concerning. Have you ever heard of another industry or group where such a large number, potentially up to 60% of the people working in that profession are leaving? That's a great question. I mean, in the groups that we've looked at, it's it's you know much lower than that, um, and some groups we don't even ask that question because it's not really something that they consider. So uh, yeah, this is head and shoulders above anything we've seen. Mm. Now, I want to talk about coping mechanisms and yep. the, I guess the go to for a lot of planners is the concept of you know having a drink. Uh, and that could be a concept of having a, having some alcohol or a drink and talking about their problems with other people, uh, but it could also be the, the concept of having a drink to cope. Uh, mm. is that, that was part of the survey. Um, yeah, so we looked at frequency of alcohol use. And, and tell us what you came up with. Yeah, I mean, well, alcohol is a, a tool that is used by a lot of people and, and most you – know, Almost the majority of people use it at the end of the day to unwind. So what we found with advisors is that close to 50% were using alcohol as some sort of way to unwind at the end of the day or to to deal with the, the stress of what they're going through. But one of the things that came out is from our data is that in no way is alcohol helping. So a lot of people are using it as a crutch or a coping mechanism, but in no way does it actually help. So they're far better using different strategies. But yeah, it's 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 something that is a reality. Yep. Now let's talk about the, the where people are going to get support. Now you just sort of mentioned that that you know with some of your conversations with the association, people weren't uh, necessarily diving into the support that is available to them. So so where are they going for support? Yeah, so by far the um, the biggest source of support is their industry peers. So 43% of, of advisors said that they their peers were moderately to highly supportive for them. Um, the second one was their licensees. So um, that came second. Third was um, product manufacturers, which was interesting. Yep. And then we start to get into um, social media, podcasts, um, digital community platforms. Um, that's that's that uh, fourth tier of support. So yeah, but by far it's the peers supporting peers was the most supportive. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. And uh, and it's good to see the product manufacturers are in there as well and, and providing that support level. Yeah, I mean it's great. It's it's good news for them and and something that. Yeah, I, I I didn't really expect, but it's it's great. Yeah, fantastic. Now, uh, one of the other things that the, the, the big outcomes for me that you mentioned, sort of, there is it split the group didn't it, in two when it came to attitude towards um, towards this, and 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 some group, uh, a lot of the group, I guess we could say, were in that that space of feeling stressed, feeling depressed, feeling burnt out. Um, but then you had uh, the the other side of the coin. We had a whole lot of thrivers. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I'm feeling right now that we all need alcohol to go to the <laughs> podcast and all the bad news. I'm just yeah. So, yeah, the hope is that there was a group we identified, which we call the Thrivers, and these are people who are crushing it professionally, 
they are evolving their business, they're, they're really enjoying the work. Um, and also, personally, they're doing really well, great work life balance, uh, not doing excessive hours, um, feeling connected in their personal life. So yeah, it was great news that we found these people. And, and what is brilliant is that these people can't be identified by some sort of demographic. So it's not it's not a certain type of person that you can go, oh, well, that's fine for them because they have this type of business or they're at this stage of their career. Um, there was no variance. What it really came down to was their individual response to the stress and pressure that they're going through. And were there any secrets in that individual response or is it like it's just 100% attitude or is it? Um, is there anything that you can pinpoint? Actually, I can. So what we... What we, okay, how do I explain this in a succinct way? So number one, there, there's the stuff that you would expect, which is, you know, they look after their well-being more. They do uh, high levels of recovery. So, you know, they, they experience the stress, but then they start to look after themselves and and take time out to decompress from the day and, um yeah, you know, whether it's physical activity or mindfulness or even a hobby or um, they do those sorts of things. The other thing they do really well is industry support. They reach out, they talk to people when they go through stress, they get support for it. Um, one of the things we found that people who weren't coping uh, d- didn't get support. They just kind of bottled it up and kept it to themselves. So that well-being stuff was very evident. The reaching out for help and being very proactive within the industry to talk to people and get ideas and innovation was very high. So if you think about the the service that you guys provide, like that is one of the key things that the thrivers really engage in. The third one is, is a little bit more complicated. And what whenever we have some sort of challenge in front of us, we yeah, you know, we have a story about that challenge. We have an emotional response to that challenge. So we, you know, we have this dialogue inside our head. And what we thought is that the thrivers would have a different dialogue about all the change that they've gone through. So maybe their narrative is, well, this is great for the industry and this is really necessary and really important. But what we discovered is everyone has the same narrative, which is this sucks, <laughs> which is this hasn't been handled very well. So, I mean, as researchers, we had to consider, well, are the thrivers just delusional and Pollyanna optimists? But they weren't. They just went, yeah, nah, this is, I, I, I don't enjoy this process. I think the, the compliance uh, could have been handled differently or how we've been treated isn't very good. Everyone had the same story. But what the thrivers were able to do is almost compartmentalise or, or put that story to the side and go, yeah, yeah, I'm frustrated, I'm angry about this, but I have these very clear goals that I want to achieve or I want to do this with my business and that stuff gets in the way. So I've got to just put it to the side and focus on the things I can control and the proactive behaviours. The people that are struggling almost climb inside that story and they get so lost in it that it it keeps hijacking their behaviour and dragging them into dysfunction. So what it is, is that cognitive ability, and and there's actually a term for it, it's called psychological flexibility, that I can experience and think things, but they don't run my behavior, my values and my goals run my behavior. Wow, that's really, really deep. I guess that probably backs up some of the stuff you did with the work you did on when you wrote the book Strive. Yeah, very much, is that ability to have a more functional relationship with struggle and discomfort. So it's almost that the thrivers went, yeah, I'm angry. Yeah, I'm pissed off. Yeah, I just, I, 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 I feel the injustice of some of the things that we've been through, but this is what I can control and this is what's important to me and here's the action I will take. Yeah. So this psychological flexibility to me then seems like the key, if you like, to what we can all do about what we can do next. Yeah, and, and, and it really parallels the research, other research that's been done in psychology right now around how do I handle depression or how do I handle anxiety or how do I handle difficult situations is that ability to almost 
park my stories and emotions off to the side and focus on the proactive behavior I need to do. So yeah, it's, it's, it's the reason I'm struggling is it's very hard to articulate that quite complex skill in a, in a short period of time, but the, the thrivers had it in buckets. Yeah. Okay, great. So the proactive behavior towards a, a goal or an outcome or a vision that you might have in the future. Yeah. Or a meaning and purpose. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Now, obviously, uh, that, you know, we've sort of been through some of the stats of the study itself and, and the findings that come out of that. But off the back of that, of course, uh, you then need to write a report and that report needs to come up with some ideas and recommendations, if you like, um, for the profession, for the regulators, for the people, um, you know, f- for advisors as well. Uh, yeah. Tell us about the report um, and then some of the, maybe some of the recommendations that are coming out of it. Yeah, actually, a great way to lead into this is what we had to do as researchers is go, all right, okay, these, the majority of these people are in a terrible state. What is creating that? So what's driving it? And what we started, what as researchers, we had to be very open-minded to go, well, is it just that the reason people are coping is that financial advisors aren't very good at their job or managing stress. Like we have to consider everything, but what we showed, or it could just be that financial advisors have terrible personal lives. That's why they're so miserable. Yeah. We, we had to consider all these things. And the biggest, what we discovered is that they are, advisors are very well set up to have good well being in terms of, their personal lives were very strong. They had great relationships. They had uh, good support. One of the biggest things is they are incredibly connected to meaning and purpose, which is very important to well-being. So across the board, what we found is that advisors went, my job is very important and I find incredible levels of purpose in it. So, And, and that's unusual because most people don't. Um, the other one was that they also found their job very stimulating and that um, and also challenging, which is important as well. So when we look at the group, it's, it's, it's almost that they couldn't be more better set up to have great well-being. So we then went, all right, so what is it? And obviously it's no surprise, but it, it is the, the change, the compliance, the, the uh, incredible pressure that's been put on them through all this change, as well as, you know, the exam and you have to have it done by this date. So, it, 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 I mean, this is something that we all kind of know intuitively, but we've just put hard numbers to it, is that it is all, everything that they've gone through is is the thing that's creating that stress. Yeah, I, I think it's really great that uh, you mentioned that concept of, you know, is it, is it, is it the, the job itself um, that's, you know, creating uh, yeah. creating that? But, you know, obviously off the back of that, the, the, the meaning and purpose, the, you know, st- stimulating and challenging and those sorts of things and the fact that most planners turn up because they've got a desire to help people in some way and help others, uh, which is which was great to be able to, I guess, remove that from one of the um, yeah. possibilities. And even the researchers at Deakin went, oh, my gosh, I was so cynical about this group before I started interviewing them. And I kind of fell in love with them because they just really care and their clients are very important to them. So, yeah, that was it. But if you look at, you know, if we want to throw some stats around government and regulation compliance, 82% of advisors said that that was highly or very highly stressful. So that's standout. The next most stressful thing is coping with the workload of the job, which was 57% of advisors. But I mean, the workload comes from number one anyway. <laughs> yeah, sure. And uh, number three was how am I going to meet my future education requirements, which was 51%. And then number four was cash flow. So, I mean, the average advisor or, or the majority of advisors run their own business. So um, you, normally cash flow is number one. But for you guys, it's number four. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that the fact that, as you mentioned, the you know the the first one, government regulation and compliance at eighty two percent, you know, workload and you know future education are yeah. both all almost part, both all part of that one set. Yeah, exactly. And what was the percentage for cash flow? Cash flow was forty seven percent, I think, off the top of my head. Wait, and let me look that up. Forty eight percent. Forty eight percent. Yeah. Right. 
And what we also did is said, well, why is all this regulation and change so stressful? And they said, well, that's the practical part of I've got to spend so much time on it. I have to constantly think about it. I don't get to do give as good a service as I would like to because so much of my time's caught up in that. But we started to go a little bit deeper and we pushed them. And one of the biggest things is the emotional, it's almost a, a grieving or a or a, like a, how do I describe it? It's it's kind of the way we've been treated, the, the, the phrases that are said about us, what's been said about us in the media, and, and almost this, well, a group's come in and imposed this stuff on us with very little consultation. So it's not that, uh, I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn here because I'm, you know, I don't know that much about the industry and the regulators, but the, the kind of narrative we got was that rather than these people came in and said, hey, you guys are really important and it's very vital for Australia to have great advice, let's work together and come up with the best possible outcomes for you, but also for the client. What they said, it's much more like, okay, you guys are all bad and we don't trust you in any way. So we're going to come in and we're going to sort you out. And that is very wounding to people that, you know, we don't trust you or you've been painted with this one brush or, you know, some of the statements that are said about them, that emotional toll cannot be underestimated. And, and I think we don't, put enough uh, like uh, I don't think we consider the emotional impact of all this change on advisors nearly enough I don't know what's your thoughts on that Fraser I I 100% agree with that I I would imagine that the results of your survey would be very different if the regulator had to come in and the the legislation had to come in saying you guys are doing you know um, you're so important we really need this this to work this is about the long-term profession and we really want to you know set you set everybody up so that the profession and and consumers all really want to come towards you and trust you know all these sorts of things in a positive way Um, I, I think that the the uptake of the reasons why everything was changed would be very different and your survey would look very, very different. I, I completely agree. And and even just, you know, getting advisors to be part of the conversation around the practicality of, you know, even the systems and the process, um, yeah, it, it would alleviate so much stress. Wow. That's really, really interesting. Um, mm. So with all these, with all this knowledge moving forward, um, and, and and if we go back to the concept of, you know, the outcomes of this, you know, survey and report that goes with it, um, I would imagine you've got recommendations for, you know, the industry itself, for planners, for for, for association groups, for uh, for the regulators, um, you know, in different, different sectors, not just like one recommendation. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we've got a number of them and, and they range from, obviously they're detailed in the report, but range from, you know, different areas of support. I mean, one of the things that was very stressful for people was the actual exam. I haven't done an exam in so long or, you know, how do I take this on? And, um, you know, particularly if they've failed that ability to come back and, and, and take it again. So it ranges from um, support around that, uh, what we found is coaching and mentoring was uh, a vital thing that that advisors need to tap into. So providing those sorts of services, as well as providing some, and this is something we're currently designing now out of, so we're designing an intervention that addresses the things we see. So that ability to teach advisors about psychological flexibility. Yeah, you know, one of the things, the biggest predictor of um the thrivers was uh, adaptability. So their ability to adapt their behavior very quickly. Um, Psychological capital, which is resilience, confidence, hope, optimism. So teaching them these psychological skills, because actually like what it is, is you have a group that have a colossal challenge that's been put to them. And some of them are thriving just because they happen to have these psychological skills. And what it is, is what we know is those skills are teachable. So it's about how do we teach them that? Um, For advisors themselves, you know, it's the things I talked about before, industry support, reaching out when you've had a stressful day, 
being a really active member in the associations and accessing some of the great things that they have, uh, getting a mentor, a coach, um, engaging in those recovery activities, um, uh, as, as well as, you know, collaborating with others to get ideas. So um, they're some of the things we'd say for the advisors themselves. I have to say that's certainly been um, helpful for me in the past as well with regards to, yeah. you know, active, actively, you know, being a member of a community, um, actively being a member of an association, actively, like, as in not just um, paying my money and expecting that that is what I, uh, I pay my money, therefore I should be yeah. getting and, and receiving, but me- mentally going it, going to that relationship as a two-way street saying, oh, yeah, I pay my money, but I'm actually going to try and give as much as I can. And the more that I give, actually, the more that I receive back um, as part of those associations and groups. Yeah, and a lot of um, thrivers they took that to a whole nother level as well where they would actively catch up with other advisors and they formed almost a mastermind group where they would go, here's what I'm struggling with, both professionally and personally. they get support, but they'd also brainstorm and go well what about this or what about that or have you have you considered this um so that's really beneficial yeah yep. in terms of the regulators these are our recommendations but obviously you know we we didn't talk to that group or we didn't engage with that group so this is just kind of our perception of of what came out of the study i think you know, supporting advisors around simpler systems around compliance and, and what is actually needed and how how could they work together to make that process just much more practical and simple. I think one of the biggest things is their attitude towards advisors in terms of respect, trust, how they talk about them, how they refer to them, uh, because when they're ref- referred to poorly like that that hurts and it, it damages the relationship there you know having a, a mentality of generally consulting and collaborating is that you know as a as a regulator I don't have all the answers and I don't know what it's like to do the job and sit in the seat so the only way I can understand that is if I collaborate and and sit down with this group to really understand them and really that's just good leadership to tell you the truth But also, I think one of the biggest things is that when they make decisions, they've got to think about the fact that my decisions impact a person and that person has staff and they're trying to run a business and they might be a a mum or a dad and that I can impose all these things, but at what cost? So I could put like ridiculous expectations on these people and they'll probably meet it because they just want to keep running their business. But What's the cost to them, to the family, to the industry, to the fact that, you know, we're chronically un- underinsured in Australia or, 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 you know, a lot of people have no financial plan. You know, if we keep crushing the industry, that number's going to grow up more and more. So that, that are our thoughts on, you know, how, how the regulators could approach this um, differently to to alleviate some of this stress and and mental health pressure. Yeah, that's really interesting. And obviously, as you mentioned, you you didn't meet with the regulators or or, yeah. or interview them. So they it we're really just getting the results of the you know the one side of the story, yeah. for example. So that, I think that's certainly uh, good to then start the conversation around um, uh, what what things could be done better or or. or or how to start that conversation, how to be able to, um, you know, have those conversations with with planners and advisors that aren't necessarily, you know, long written submissions to a to a question or whatever it might be. So be able to have that, um, uh, you know, open up that conversation. So I'd, I'd, I'd be interested. Yeah, in and, and if, you know, if we did this study on regulators, we'd probably find similar things where they've got pressure and they've got stress and and that they have expectations placed on them. So yeah, we also have to be compassionate for that group, but. It's about getting them to to have a more functional relationship with advisors. I think is 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 the key, and and what underpins that is their attitude and the mindset that they bring to this group. Yeah, and we and and as you mentioned, the the language that's used, but that's but that's also a two way street as well, right? Yeah, very much. And I mean, one even one of the little things that a lot of thrivers said is that even when I'm on a, a an online forum or I'm commenting on an article, 
you know, that I try to stay away from that real toxic, attacking, aggressive language and that, you know, I might, I might feel frustrated, but we can get lost in that kind of downward spiral. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. So is this toxic? Do I really need to be involved in it? Yeah. Now, uh, I just want to go back to financial advisors here and some of the outcomes. Uh, you mentioned the concept of, you know, investing in yourself, investing in that psychological flexibility um, and, and, some, and you know, going to, as you mentioned, that teachable skill. So seeking out and finding somebody or something that can help you learn those skills. Yeah. Where and how? Like what, um, without getting into too specifics, what, what would you suggest if I was saying to you right now, where, where do I start? Okay, it's a, it's a difficult question. The area of psychological flexibility is a quite a new area in psychology. And, you know, the, the research has probably been gaining momentum over the last 12 years, but it's still quite a new area of, of science. And, you know, a, a lot of areas have 20 to 30 years of research before we really start to implement it. So, I mean, if you are listening to this and you go, actually, I want to start to research that, I mean, Google psychological flexibility or YouTube it, like there's people that talk about it. Um, it's sometimes referred to as ACT therapy, A-C-T. Um, but, I mean, this is one of the things we're doing is that a lot of people say, well, okay, you've done this research and done this report, now what? So what we're at the stage of doing is designing an intervention. So we've done this with various in industries the thing about advisors is their their world is so nuanced and different and complex that you really need an intervention. So rather than just saying to people, well, practice mindfulness or get your step count up or just look on the bright side, they need something a bit more, like much more tailored and, and specific and really driven around behaviour change. So we're in the process of, of doing that. Um, and, and we've designed that. So we'll start to launch that. So that's a, a resource that people can tap into as well down the track. Um, or as we go earlier, you know, those suggestions around just make sure I'm getting support, make sure I'm looking after my well-being, make sure I'm focusing on what I can control and the constructive behaviours, have real clear goals and, and work towards those are some of the things that advisors can do. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, and as you mentioned, also, you know, reach out to your peers and uh, support networks and, and let them oh, know what you're doing and, and, and get yeah. them involved in the conversation as well. And, and we couldn't reinforce that nearly enough. Like that, that what you just said then is so vital. Yep. Uh, is there anything that the, the industry or the profession could be doing, you know, a little bit more of as well? Um, actually, I would put this, my my gut reaction to that is that, I've spoken to a lot of the associations and they're being proactive. The licensees have been proactive. Um, I think it's much more about the advisor like putting their hand up or or being proactive about tapping into some of these things. They, that's not to kind of beat them up or give them another thing to do, but it's just my initial reaction to that question is there's support out there. You just got to tap into it. And a, massive difference between the thrivers and the people that aren't coping was that they went when they went through something stressful they spoke to people i think it was i'll have to check the stat but i think it was about 84 percent of advisors did not after a stressful event did not talk to or take time to kind of get over it they just went oh i'm just moving on to the next thing and all this stuff builds up and up and up and starts to become toxic and really has a negative impact on them. It, this this feels in a way as it's a, a human response to something that is being, you know, pushed in a negative way upon somebody uh, rather than presented as an opportunity. Surely we could predict these results in that case. Oh, totally. Like it, it's almost every time I do research, I think research just backs up what we already know. Like it, of, of course that they're in this. I, their reaction to this situation, I think, is incredibly normal. That, that's what I would say, is that they have gone through colossal amounts of change continually um, with very low autonomy or any sort of way to influence it for a very long time. And you can't, you can't be in that state and it not have an impact. 
Now let's let's try and finish this sort of on more of a positive note. The, 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 <laughs> Good luck. The, uh, the the report's coming out. Obviously, at the time of recording this podcast, the report was not released, but it it may be released at the time of you, you listening to this podcast. Um, talk to us about what the next steps from here are, like releasing the report, then you know using this information to you know you know shape the future to say we or, or maybe we didn't get it right in the past but surely we can use this information to get it right next time yeah obviously our view of this report is to just try and make each group more constructive whether it's you know a regulator reading it whether it's a a, a licensee whether it's a, a, an advisor themselves is we encourage everyone to just to read the report and digest it um Obviously, uh, we're going to do PR around it and spread the word and the messages um, because I recently presented at AIA's um, conference and, yeah, I talked about some of these things and and the biggest piece of feedback was, wow, this tells me that I'm not alone. You know, I often felt that I was the only advisor that couldn't cope or maybe I was just crap and I couldn't hack it or maybe I was weak and I, I should be stronger. And so this is very validating for a lot of people. But then obviously we want to move into action and improvement. And each of those groups, I encourage them to start to think about the stuff in the report and take some action. And as I said before, you know, we're going to look at uh, putting resources together that fill some of these gaps that are there for advisors that are struggling. Yeah, I think uh, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said that the reaction to this, uh, the, the change process that we've been through is completely normal. Yeah. Totally. Well, well, fantastic. We look forward to uh, finding those resources that you're creating. Uh, we look forward to everybody taking action, um, working on their psychological flexibility, which is uh, an ongoing. I'm actually uh, uh, in the middle of a book by uh, Simon Sinek, which is called The Infinite Game, which sort of talks very much around the, the concept of uh, – you know, how, what parameters we put around things to start with and whether that they should be there or not. They're obviously there in business, they're there in sport. But when, when uh, we talk about life, it's not really a, a parameters game. Yeah. But uh, thank you so much for coming and sharing the results. Really appreciate it. And we look forward to catching up with you again soon. If somebody wants to find the survey or the results, probably what, what's the best way for them to, to find uh, it? The best way is um, go to my website. Um, and, and contact us. Uh, we're going to release the report. Obviously, AIA, who sponsored it, are going to be sending it out far and wide. You could talk to your AIA rep. Um, you know, they'll they'll have access to the report. Um, or, yeah, as I said before, just contact us and go, you know, I, I can't find it. I like a copy of it. Yep, fantastic. And uh, as we mentioned previously, this has been heavy fairly heavy conversation so if you uh, if you're feeling like you need to talk to somebody please reach out to one of your peers or your associations or anybody that can uh, support you in any way thank you dr adam fraser my pleasure thanks fraser well there you have it another episode of the xy advisor podcast i'm fraser jack and i'm joined by emily blanche hey em hey fraser my favorite time of the week it's our favorite time of the week we get to do some shout outs and uh and celebrate some amazing xy members Yes. All right. I think this is quite fitting for today's episode as well. I would love to give a shout out to Adele Martin. So off the back of the well-being report into the health or mental health of or mental state, I should say, of financial advisors, this inspired Adele to jump into the platform and share some of the strategies or the things that she uses in her own life um, to keep a good mindset, if you know, like to uh, not fall into the traps of, of ill mental health. Um, it revolved around daily exercise, so even just getting out for 15 minutes. Mindset was a huge one, setting clear boundaries and keeping a good day book to remind her of all the good things that do happen throughout the day. So a few other people jumped in with the tips and strategies that they use as well, and I thought it was just a really great post uh, to help anyone out there who just might need a little spring in their step. 